Despite some recent indications that the inflation picture may be getting worse, not better, Jay Powell continues to lead the market to believe that there will be rate cuts in 2024. But in recent weeks, there's been a development that may change the Fed's mind. Oil prices have accelerated the upside, gaining 8% since March 27th, adding to a stunning 25% gain since mid-December. Other commodities like wheat and corn have also stopped their multi-year slide and have shown some small recent strength. Coming up today, stocks trade flat, ahead of the big inflation report tomorrow. What will Jay Powell do if inflation doesn't go down? Commodities adding to inflation risks. What could upset the gold rally? Will Ethereum ETFs be approved? Google breaks out to a new all-time high, whilst Nvidia loses its 50-day. Well, it was a bit of an interesting day of trading here going into CPI tomorrow. We initially sold off, looked like the market got wind of the CPI report early before we recovered and bounced. Interesting at all stock sectors, we've got financials, sensitive to rates and with earnings coming out this Friday, still pulling back in the short term, along with momentum stocks as well. And there's a look at the five minute chart from today's action. Kind of did a bit of a waterfall into mid morning before we found support, drifted higher than found support again, the last hour of trading when we popped right back up. And so for now, the S&P 500 still holding above its 50 day average, a little bit of a bounce back in short term breadth, a bit more of a pullback in volatility under 50 15. Option dealers pricing and a bit of movement tomorrow with the VIX one day popping up to 18. Bond yields pulling back a little and we had the momentum factor ETF losing its 50 day for the first time all year before quickly recovering as well. However, what was interesting today was arguably the most important stock in the market, Nvidia closing below its 50 day VWAP at 8.53 and trading a little bit lower after hours as I speak. We also saw a bit of a rip in clean energy stocks today, especially solar stocks with a tan ETF up over 4%. And interesting, just looking at sectors, it was actually yield sensitive sectors of REITs and utilities finishing the day higher with financials and industrials finishing lower. And so in the morning, it looked like the market got a taste of CPI, didn't like what it saw sold off but then it recovered and the yield sensitive sectors ended up finishing higher with that price action implying that maybe we don't get a hot print tomorrow and so it'll be interesting to see what cpi does come in the market has been coiling up going into it could be a bit of a make or break moment we know momentum stocks have been pulling back these last few weeks whilst we've seen a rotation into energy and commodity stocks the last two cpi prints we got came in hotter than expected and headline is expected to come in at 3.4 percent year over year increase tomorrow and economists are expecting that to have grown from February's reading of 3.2%. And there's a look at the one year chart of CPI. We can see it's beat now the last three times in a row and has definitely stalled out since July last year. That's nine months inflation's been flatlining, if not ticking a little higher. And so a lot of people are wondering, will inflation ever go down? Are we ever gonna get that 2% handle Jay Powell so desperately wants. Well, looking underneath the hood of inflation, it's really core services that have been keeping it high. You can see that here in the red with the latest year over year change coming in a bit over 3%. And what's really helped the overall inflation picture the last 18 months since we've peaked out is that of food, which its latest reading is at 0.3% year over year increase and especially energy, which is still just holding on to negative territory with year over year change in the prices we pay, along with core goods. And that's been largely thanks to the overall commodity complex, which in the same time has come down significantly. However, that's changed a lot, especially in the last month. Looking at agricultural commodity fund, it's now in a strong uptrend. Lucky for Jay Powell, we still don't have corn and wheat, two really important agricultural commodities in uptrends just yet. However, we're keeping an eye on them. And so it's kind of a double-edged sword because the commodities rally isn't all just about geopolitics and underinvestment for the last 15 years and changing investor sediment and positioning. It also reflects a better economy, underlying demand. Demand. And so it could be a story of too much of a good thing that eventually causes a resurgence in inflation, which then causes a recession. However, that might not be pushed out until next year now. And even though rising commodities, rising inflation could upset the Fed's plan to cut interest rates, the economy and the stock market could still keep powering ahead regardless. And we've already got commodities outperforming the S&P 500 year to date. With signs of manufacturing picking up around the world, especially in the two biggest economies, US and China, and even though services 
have still been in expansion mode. It's manufacturing around the world that had been in contraction territory for over a year and a half. And now we're back into expansion territory above 50. And that's why we've got some key inputs into manufacturing rallying as well. With the rise in crude also pulling up treasury bond yields going against Fed speak, maybe indicating to the Fed that it can't cut rates just yet. And so tomorrow could be a really important report as the market's still undecided what the Fed's going to do in June. You can see that in Fed fund futures pricing. The Fed's set to meet in about three weeks on the 1st of May. It's pretty much a given they're going to stay on hold. However, when they meet again in June, market's still given a bit better than half chance that they'll cut. However, these numbers could change a lot after 8.30 tomorrow morning Eastern Standard Time when we get the latest CPI inflation figures. And what could really help the situation and what the Biden administration and diplomats are pushing for is to motivate Israel to negotiate a ceasefire with Hamas, cool things down over in the Gaza Strip. However, we could still get a big response from Iran any day now as revenge to Israel for their strike early last week. And Iran may not strike Israel directly. However, they may do it via their proxies in Syria, Iraq, and instruct their rebel subsidiaries to dial things up against Israel. However, Israel is not going to hold back, nor are they going to step down in what appears to be a desire to take the fight to Iran, with signs that they're even preparing to strike Iranian nuclear power plants and disable them from being able to launch nuclear weapons in the future. So the ball's really in Iran's court now for how far they want to take this. And so even though we got a little bit of a pullback in crude today, the market's still in trend mode. And once again, we saw higher highs, higher lows in the price of gold, floating with 2,400 an ounce. However, we're looking a little stretched here in the short term. And even though we're due a short-term pullback, some say there could be some other things that derail gold's record-setting rally. That's senior financial advisor Bob Parker said the metal isn't supported by fundamentals. As yields rise, the dollar strengthens and the Fed policy stays tight and attributes the latest rally to being fueled by a catch-up effect given last year's underperformance. Going on to say he thinks gold is now very vulnerable to a setback and pointing to rising treasury yields that are likely to keep a lid on the price of gold. And there's other ways to play the bull market in gold other than just owning the underline itself, like we can see with this hedge fund manager, Harris Kupperman, who expects rising domestic and global tensions to continue driving volatility this year. And he's not so much a fan of the underline and gold miners. However, he is of one stock called Amark Precious Metals, a dominant wholesale dealer with a substantial presence in sales to retail consumers, along with ownership in two mints. They're fully hedged against metal price moves and instead earn a spread between the price they pay and the price that they charge customers, usually referenced to the spot price. Amark sold 2.6 million ounces of gold and 156 million ounces of silver in 23 for total revenues of 9.2 billion. The company functions like an exchange, prospering on volumes, with elevated capital returns funding deals, customer growth, buybacks, and dividends. He said, in my mind, AMARC trades cheaply only because most investors do not yet know about it or associate it with the preferred way to play gold. And it's pretty interesting, this stock, AMARC Precious Metals, got a market cap of only 862 million, dividend yield of 2%. You can see annual revenue is growing. 429 employees coming out of California. Some strong price action on the daily chart here. We've gone back to trend, big explosive momentum breakout on volume and there's a look at the long-term monthly chart looking pretty constructive as well after it's been consolidating for the last couple of years we could be on the verge of a breakout here and he's right about fair value my stock fair value indicator has it at 112 dollars saying we're currently 66 percent undervalued and like he said you could think of it as like a gold and commodity exchange that a lot of investors don't really know about. We've got an 862 million market cap on a company with growing revenues that did 9.2 billion in sales last year. Compare that to Coinbase, something everyone knows about. And it's easy to see why my stock fair value indicator as it is significantly overvalued. It's got a market cap of 58 billion and there's its revenue last year, 3 billion. So it does about a third of the revenue of AMARC, yet trades at 60 times a higher market cap valuation. And so we'll be keeping an eye on this stock going forward. AMARC Precious Metals as a different way to play the boom in commodities. As like the hedge fund manager said, they're not so much linked to the underlying itself, but rather the trading surrounding, which is starting to pick up now that it's breaking out. And it's not just precious metals breaking out, it's also base metals like copper as like plenty of other commodities years and years of underinvestment have led to a huge demand and supply gap in favor of higher prices along with a shift in investment and policy towards clean energy further choking supply of these traditional commodities with traders and investors starting to wake up to this commodity as well with a big difference between spot price and futures 
Typically a bullish sign. We haven't seen a gap like that in about 30 years. And this is going to be an important commodity as part of an AI powered world going forward along with uranium nuclear energy. And there's a look at the daily on copper futures. It's got some nice trend in there. A steep contango forward curve in the market. And there's a look at the most popular copper ETF under ticker COPEX. 2 billion assets under management, 38 holdings. And that's a diversified ETF as well. With stocks all around the world inside this fund. And it too on the long term monthly chart looking pretty constructive, close to all time highs and breaking out here. Moving on to cryptos, what we're currently looking at is whether Ethereum ETFs are gonna be next. It does seem like a natural progression after Bitcoin ETFs were approved in mid January to then approve the second largest crypto Ethereum. And the Securities and Exchange Commission has until late May to approve or deny applications to launch the first ETFs that would hold Ether. And some current fund managers that actually have spot Bitcoin ETFs are actually saying the SEC will reject Ether ETFs. And that's Van Eck and CoinShares are not confident the SEC will approve their Ethereum applications. And the CEO of Van Eck went on to say, the way the legal process goes is the regulators will give you comments on your application. And that happened for weeks and weeks before the Bitcoin ETFs. And right now, pins are dropping as far as Ethereum is concerned. As SEC Chair Gary Gensler is still not too hot on the industry, really came across as he was kind of forced to do it in tandem with federal agencies clamping down on the prior leaders of the crypto industry, handing it over to Wall Street to take care of now. And so it's strange since they approved Bitcoin if they don't approve Ethereum. And maybe that's why we got a little bit of a pullback here today. Currently just sitting right at the 50, above 3,500, along with Bitcoin trading a little better. However, if they were going to get approved, a potentially good way to play it could be long the grayscale Ethereum trust and short the underlying Ethereum as a spread trade, which is similar to the spread trade that worked really well going into the Bitcoin ETF launch. Long the grayscale Bitcoin trust, short Bitcoin, as we really got news that Bitcoin ETFs were coming back in mid last year. This spread actually increased 70% until when the Bitcoin ETFs were actually launched on the market. We've pretty much gone sideways since then as that discount in the grayscale Bitcoin trust was evaporated. And we can see that in this chart here of the discount to net asset value of the grayscale Bitcoin trust. Mid last year, about 44% discount. Here we are now, just 1.5% under NAV. Compare that to the grayscale Ethereum trust that's still trading a healthy 26% discount to NAV. And so if they were going to get approved, then this spread should do well, while removing the risk of movement from the underlying. Just a way to play the closing of the gap in the discount to NAV. Whilst we're looking at spreads, is one of my favorites performing well at the moment. That's the long Bitcoin iShares Trust, short the hugely overvalued micro strategy. But a pretty nice move off the bottom here. Obviously a really volatile spread. Also got silver versus gold moving higher and a little bit of an uptrend in gold miners versus gold. And so if you haven't already, hit that subscribe button and I'll keep you up updated on this spread here of the grayscale Ethereum trust versus the underlying Ethereum and how this plays out going into the potential listing of Ethereum ETFs and just want to say a quick thanks to all my regular viewers for hitting that like button on these videos every day it shows me that you do appreciate and value these videos and really helps to motivate me to keep making them for you and giving you unique insights into the market that you won't find on any other YouTube channel. As in my opinion, most other YouTubers out there don't really trade. Whereas on this channel here with Click Capital, not only do I share with you some of my trades and investments, I also gave out my top 10 ETF picks at the start of this year, which we track. And as a portfolio, they're up 7.1% with my number one pick, Cannabis, up over 44% year to date. And we're still looking for more good things to come in that space. And so as I said at the start of this video, we had Nvidia losing its 50 day for the first time in a while. Semis, growth stock, momentum, cryptos and meme stocks all having a pullback while we're seeing this big rotation into energy and commodities, along with an uptick in bond yields. It's so obviously Nvidia still head and shoulders above the competition. However, the competition is heating up. We saw that with Intel launching its latest AI chip in a direct shot at Nvidia's moneymaker. And that's the company's latest Gaudi 3 chip that matches and exceeds Nvidia's H100 AI processor when it comes to training and deploying generative AI models. And the H100 is really what powered Nvidia over the last year, even though now they've got the latest iteration Blackwell. According to Intel, the Gaudi 3, 40% more power efficient with 50% faster inferencing than Nvidia's H100. We've also got Alphabet breaking out to new all time highs on their new cloud chips, as we're seeing a trend now for big tech companies wanting to own more of their own supply chain when it comes to hardware and create their own in-house design semiconductors on top of securing their own power supply in the form of nuclear energy. And so Google's partnered with ARM to create Google Axion, which is an ARM-based CPU for the data center. And they're boasting better stats 
than what's currently available to them as well. We're also seeing Google inspire more confidence in the market of their move towards becoming an AI company, not only for consumers, but in enterprise products as well. After a few hiccups, initially launching Gemini, still some issues with wokeism that they're working quickly to address. And ever since we got that news that they partnered with Apple for iPhones to be powered by Google's chatbot Gemini, we gapped up on a momentum thrust and have held, and my regular viewers will remember back here, I said Google's looking the best out of all mega cap tech stocks, primed for an all-time breakout, and we've got that. Since then, again, finding new highs today, getting a bit of trend back here, and just going through all the mega cap tech stocks, apart from Amazon, which is almost back to all-time highs from a few years ago. Meta not too far behind it, it's really Alphabet Google, looking the best on the chart, and in terms of valuation as well. And so it had been Nvidia, and Meta leading the Magnificent 7 higher. Apple and Tesla kind of in their own little bear markets. Now we've got Amazon and Alphabet, Google leading the pack with Tesla kind of at an inflection point as well. Got earnings just around the corner. Stock and business along with Elon Musk have been under a lot of pressure lately. Had a few misses on deliveries. Last couple of earnings, the market's going to be really hanging its hat on the Cybertruck and RoboTaxi to kind of turn it around get investors inspired again, and get analysts increasing earnings expectations going forward so the market can price in more growth and it can continue to defend its lofty valuation versus other automakers. Not only that, we've got Apple racing to the party, partnering with Google to get a chatbot into their iPhones. Hinting at the market, they're going to get into home robotics, and they're also banking on being a big player in the future industry of virtual reality. However, that's still yet to be seen. We'll get to hear from Apple with their earnings in 23 days, in which we'll get to hear for the first time how their initial sales for their Vision Pro have gone. And so far, there's been some feedback with users suffering black eyes, headaches, and neck pain, as it's still version one of this new product that's yet to be proven whether it can be a money spinner for Apple, because at three and a half thousand dollars, it's clearly a niche market, nowhere near a mainstream price, and they still may have a ways to go with actually creating a quality product that people want if they are gonna pay such a big price. Because like one person said, it's like wearing a computer strapped to your face. Just moving on, there's the greed index pulling back softly, going into tomorrow's CPI, and corporate insiders, nowhere to be seen. Doing a whole lot of buying or selling down here. There's a look at high yield bonds, just kind of holding their range now. Same with the dollar index going sideways. And there's a look at the monthly chart of silver. Coming back up to highs from early 2021. Another bump up for Chinese securities, pressing up against this long downward trend line. One of my long-term favorites, hydrogen, having a nice move up today. And energy stocks, Exxon Mobil and Chevron, continuing to hold up there. Another high for Root Insurance, really hot stock at the moment, and JP Morgan softening a little bit as we go into earnings this coming Friday. All right, guys, there we have it for this Tuesday session, finishing the day pretty much flat in the S&P 500, with all markets kind of just on standby until tomorrow morning. It will be really interesting to see what print we get and the market's reaction, so make sure you come back to the Click Capital channel tomorrow. Well, I'll break everything down for you and give you my best analysis and thoughts on what it all could mean. Thanks very much for tuning in, and I'll see you again tomorrow. Cheers.